Hey, welcome to the um, series of lectures on the reproductive system. Today, I'm just talking about an overview of the male reproductive system. The topics I'm gonna to go through are just uh, the embryology and a little bit of anatomy and physiology and just a couple of the pathologies. Basically, um, in, in terms of embryology, everything starts out exactly the, the same. And then things change around six weeks during um, embryo embryologic development. So at six weeks, you can't tell a difference between male and female. The internal genitalia looks the same. The male gonads are all the way up in the abdomen, just like where the female's uh, gonads end up staying. And then at six weeks, things start to change. With chromosomal, chromosomal influence, at about 10 weeks, female development starts, and then male development uh, begins as well with the test testosterone influence, the uh, testicles, moving down through the inguinal canal, and then um, at birth being in the scrotum. So true or false, men and women secrete the same hormones at the level of the brain. The hormones would be the ones from the hypothalamus, gonadotropin releasing hormone, and then follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone from the anterior pituitary. And that is true. We're the same um, hormonally at the level of the brain. So there it is. What happens is down, downstream where LH, LH and FSH act differently. So luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone affect um, ovaries different from the way they affect testicles. So the genitalia, the external um, characteristics, male versus female, begin changing at six weeks. And this is all because of the gene expression. So these two uh, groups for the female with the XX chromosome, gonadotropin releasing hormone, LH, FSH, and then downstream at the ovarian level is the estrogen versus men, gonadotropin releasing hormone, LH, FSH, and then down to testosterone at the testicles. These are called homologs. So at six weeks of age, they look the same. There's the uh, labial scrotal swelling, genital, tubercle. And then at five, and again at six weeks, everything starts changing based on your chromosomes. So at the male, um, the penis begins, and the homolog for the penis in the female is the clitoris. And then, of course, get the scrotal swelling. The homolog in a woman is the labia majora and labia minora. And then at birth, they look different where the scrotum is containing the testicles. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about cultural traditions and how um, they culturally, they change the external genitalia. Okay, the first is uh, circumcision, removal of the foreskin. Um, this usually happens um, or is done just after birth in many cultures. Um, and it does ha have uh, some actual 
medical benefits, including there is a reduced rate of infection. There's actually a reduced rate of transmission for many um, sexually transmitted diseases. Also, I've seen patients um, come in with phimosis where the foreskin is unretractable. And a little boy I saw he had phimosis to the extent that it actually closed off his ability to urinate. So in some cultures, um, circumcision is used as a rite of passage. Um, this is an image I took from a travel in uh, Uganda, in the Bugisu region. Um, circumcision is a rite of passage and it's not only used um, as a tradition, but also um, boys are expected um, to show bravery through this period of having their circumcision. So the age is about 16 to 18 years of age and they run in a costume, they cover them up with um, mud and decorate them. And then after the end of three days, after they've been running them, They'll give them a sip of alcohol and they have to stand unflinching and a machete or um, the other thing I've seen is the use of just a knife where they remove the pub, uh, foreskin in a public ceremony. So there is also female circumcision. Um, this is uh, more common in some of these areas shown um, in this demographic image here. And there's different degrees of circumcision for a female. They can go from just removing the clitoris to removing the um, labia majora, menora, the whole external genitalia, and then they sew the tissues back together um, and leave a very, very small opening for menstrual flow and urination. So there are uh, degrees of um, circumcision. And um, this is one of the signs some of these uh, countries, some of the governments are trying to stop it. Um, the problem is trying to stop traditions because they're long held beliefs going all the way back um, 2000 years ago in Rome that um, having a woman who is circumcised showed aristocracy. Um, it gave assurance, especially when they did the extreme version of female circumcision, showing to a prospective husband that he is getting a virgin. And of course, it is also a rite of passage for young girls. And this is also done, I think, at age about six or eight. Complications from this, of course, if it's um, unsterile blades, they can have strictures, bleeding, they can get infections. All right, let's go on to male anatomy and the physiology. Um, the best way to remember the male structures is to remember the path of sperm. And there is an acronym called 7UP to remember the path of sperm. So this is a sagittal view showing the testicles, epididymis, and then the duct system that takes it all the way up on top of the bladder, down through the prostate and out through the urethra. So this is a labeled image showing not only the duct work, but some of these accessory glands. And if you take it going from the seminiferous tubules, which is inside of the testicle itself where the sperm are being formed. That starts the S in seven up. The epididymis where the um, sperm is stored, the vas deferens, this area, this duct, this is the duct that's being cut during the vasectomy. And then that goes all the way up over the bladder and then comes around behind, goes through the prostate and then the urethra. The only thing that doesn't stand for something is the N in seven. 
And that's just a placeholder, seven up. So up means urethra and P, penis. Another image showing um, the structures. This is from Visible Body. And the urethra is colored in blue. These other accessory glands we'll go through now. And they add um, fluids, energy to help the sperm on their journey. So the first one, look at that bulbo urethra glands. They're tiny little glands. And they're right here at the opening between um, the prostate, right here at the prostate where the bladder comes in. So they've got this same outflow, common outflow tract, urine as well as sperm. And then just sitting right there is those bulbo urethral glands. So what do you think the purpose of the bulbo urethral glands would be? Um, they stop the flow of urine or they neutralize the urine. And there is your hint from a former lecture on the kidneys, the physiology. Think about all what the kidneys are doing with urine. So the answer is they neutralize the urine because coming out of the kidneys are extra hydrogen ions. So the urine is potentially very acidic, could be damaging to the semen. So these little guys right here, these bubble urethra glands, alkalinize um, this tract, the upper urethra tract, neutralizing the acid from the urine. The seminal vesicles. Now this is a posterior view. And for me, it looks all the world like an apple. The prostate gland looking like the apple itself and these seminal vesicles looking like the leaves when you pull it, an apple off a tree. So the seminal vesicles are providing energy. So this is a little guy, I wrote the word sperm on him. And in his backpack, he's carrying an apple as his energy source. So they add fluids and chemicals to the spermatic fluid to give them energy, packed lunch. The seminal vesicles, they got the sugar, prostaglandins, the energy, and they give the um, sperm motility and penetration when they get to the ovary. So these accessory glands, three of them in total, have the seminal vesicles, the leaves of the apple. They provide sugar and prostaglandins. The prostate here, um, shown this posterior view, this exterior surface of the prostate has been removed in the visible body app. And then down here, three of those tiny little bulbal urethral glands neutralizing acid. So all those things are needed to make really effective um, sperm. So true or false, a vasectomy will noticeably diminish the amount of ejaculate. And vas means vas deferens, ectomy means removal. So removal of these, of a piece, a portion of duct right here, and they make a little tiny incision right here in the scrotum, grab the um, vas deferens, and just tie them off. The answer, it's false. At this level, um, the sperm are coming out of the epididymis, and they're very low um, concentration of fluid at that point. So less than 5% of semen is sperm. The rest are those um, fluids from the prostate, seminal vesicles. So um, I want you to also notice that during a vasectomy, only this duct work 
they're also major vessels that are supplying the testicles for hormonal um, stimulation. So the testicles are still making hormones. The testicular, ah, the testicular size does not change after a vasectomy. It's just that these little sperm have nowhere to go. Fun fact, smoking has more of an effect on semen volume than a vasectomy. This is a cross-section of a male penis. This is, these are the tissues. I need to explain these tissues so we can get into understanding how the erection, um, the physiology of erection. So these uh, two upper spots of the penis, the corpora cavernosa. So these are caverns that hold blood to maintain the erection. And then there's another section, the corpora spongiosum, a different tissue. And within the middle of that is the urethra, that little, that slit. So two types of connective tissue. So why doesn't the urethra collapse during an erection? Is it your corpora cavernosum, cavernosa, or the corpora spongiosum? The answer is it's your corpora spongiosum. Remember, sponges hold their shape. All right, let's go on to a medical disease, um, sickle cell disease, where um, cells get these abnormal shape from the abnormal hemoglobin. And because they're abnormally shaped, they lose their flexibility and they will occlude small vessels. And this isn't just in the male penis. This is also throughout the body. So a sickle crisis, people can get severe abdominal pain, ischemia to the bowel, um, and other areas of the body so they can get infarctions in other small vessels as well. The complication on the male side of it is they can get a sustained erection. It's called priapism is the name for a sustained erection. Now, of course, priapism can also happen in um, overdose of Viagra, for instance. So that's another situation for priapism. So priapism, the, or the physiology of the erection, is the arteries dilate. And with dilation of the arteries, they compress the veins and you get a temporary vascular outlet obstruction. Sustained outlet obstruction, you'd start seeing ischemia or um, hypoxia. So you'd start getting too much compression and then you start damaging the vascular supply. So that's why priapism um, or a sustained erection more than I think four hours is what the warning is that you need to seek medical attention. And the treatment um, for that is a needle aspiration of the blood within that corpora cavernosa, and then the irrigation of irrigation with saline. Next question. Why do anabolic steroids, an, an anabolic steroid, the same thing as testosterone, ex, exogenous testosterone, why does that cause testicular atrophy? Is it the interruption of a negative feedback loop or an interruption of a positive feedback loop? Now I'm taking you back to the endocrine system as a quick review. The answer is it's an interruption of a negative feedback loop. Remember, almost all the systems in the body are negative feedback loop. There's a couple positive feedback loops like oxytocin for labor and the blood clotting cascade. Those are um, positive feedback loops. The hypothalamus, remember, it releases um, gonadotropin-releasing hormone. 
stimulates the anterior pituitary to release LH and FSH. And those hormones stimulate the testicles to produce testosterone. And it's that stimulation of those hormones that make the um, testicles the size they are. And if you get endogenous, exogenous, excuse me, if you get external testosterone, um, then you don't have that stimulation and the testicles shrink in size. All right, so we're going on to the testicles now for a couple, couple comments. First question, in humans, blue balls is a dangerous situation. True or false? And this is an image of some of the, um, the monkeys that I saw when I was in Africa. And this is a way to um, actually attract females. So this is not a situation for them. I just thought it was curious. The answer is blue balls is not a dangerous situation for these monkeys or for men either, humans. Um, the medical term for blue balls is epididymal hypertension. And it happens because there's a sustained arousal without release or without ejaculation. So blood not only fills the penis, it also comes down into the epididymis. And with that extra um, epididymal blood flow, the testicles get heavier um, and they can get a little bit uncomfortable. And they, you know, eventually over a few minutes to hours, they eventually regress to normal or go back to the normal size. But, um, the name came from the potential of blood sitting there and getting deoxygenated. So that's why it came to the word blue because they don't, they, but they don't actually turn blue. Okay, another medical disease is a hydrocele down into the scrotum. And if there's um, some peritoneum down in there, you can get impaired reabsorption of this uh, fluid from the peritoneum, and you can develop this um, hydrocele. So hydro is water. So it's like a water cyst around the testicle. Now this is more common in um, really hot climates. It can also happen with parasitic diseases where obstruction of lymph flow will cause uh, hydrocele. And this is a little clinic um, many years ago where they did many um, hernias and hydrocells each day. And when I arrived, they were doing this all under local infiltration of anesthetic and giving them medications, um, actually getting directly in veins, not even starting an IV. Patients were moving all over the place. So it was a high risk for infection. So this is where we started an anesthesia um, spinal program. Like I said, this is many years ago um, and masks were down doing these spinals, but you should see everybody now wearing a mask. So having this spinal program using very, very low doses of spinal lidocaine, you can reduce um, the over sedation and reduce patient movement and hopefully by virtue of that, reduce infection. So we've gone over the path of sperm, the importance of those accessory glands providing energy, the physiology of erection, and then a few um, pathological situations, medical diseases. So in summary, women have to deal with menstruation, pregnancy, childbirth, breastfeeding, menopause, hot flashes and men have to deal with women. So the next couple um, presentations are coming up. We're gonna go through female reproduction and I'm giving them two lectures. So um, last comment, Betty White, her famous quote, or one of her famous quotes, why do people say grow balls 
Balls are weak and sensitive. If you really want to get tough, grow vagina. Those things take a pounding. Thank you, Betty White. Any questions, comments? Please leave um, anything in the comment 